Hey, I'm Sarah Tigander, international speaker and trainer for a $40 million division in healthcare. With over a decade of experience working with healthcare providers, I believe that a healthcare practice should do more than just pay back student loans. Each week, I'll bring you the tips, tricks, and experts you need to build your practice both on and offline. Smart people take notes, so grab a pen or open up the Notes app on your phone as we dive into the Health of Your Business podcast. Hi, girlfriends. I'm really excited to introduce you to one of my girlfriends who I have met in masterminding. And I don't know if you guys know, but I am a mastermind junkie. My husband and I, we decided a few years ago, probably, oh, it was when I was pregnant with Ella, we decided that we weren't going to go to grad school, we weren't going to get our master's, we weren't going to go out for a doctorate, but we still thought it was really important to invest in ourselves and to continue to uh, be educated and to continue to learn. And so I am now on, I think it's my third or fourth, you know, maybe this is my fourth and fifth, the fourth and fifth mastermind. And this one I'm in with a fellow girlfriend, Jacqueline Kinzer. And what I love about Jacqueline is that she is a practitioner herself as a board certified lactation consultant, and she's an oral facial myologist. I hope I have that right, Jacqueline. Um, but it really means that she specializes in, I, I think it's like tongue placement and uh, breathing, and I, I think that goes with lactation with uh, babies and how she is a specialist with that. But uh, the cool thing is, is that she's been running her own practice for the past three years very successfully, but she's been consulting with other healthcare practices for the past seven years. Uh, she does a lot of cool things. She teaches for a midwifery school. She trains other lactation consultants, and. Most recently, she is running a group coaching program for holistic practitioners who are looking to grow their practices. And one thing I can say, I just messaged Jacqueline the other day and told her how stinking proud I am of her because she is blowing up. My favorite place to follow Jacqueline is either uh, on Instagram, because I think she's super personal, on her Instagram account with Holistic Lactation. But I also really love her Facebook group. So I hope that uh, you do some digging on the internet and you can find that. And her website uh, is all in the show notes, including a free practice launch map guide with everything that you need to start a private practice. So you're going to want to grab that in the show notes after But this, truly, when I named this episode um, in stepping into your power as a practitioner, that's exactly what Jacqueline does. She marries together the tactical work with the mindset, with the vision. And I don't even know if this podcast episode does justice to just how transformational it has been for me to follow Jacqueline. Uh, I'm so inspired by her. So um, let's just get right into this episode with Jacqueline Kinzer. Jacqueline, I wish we were still together like we were last week in gorgeous, sunny California, but I don't think your weather, I, I'm looking out the window at a pile of snow and I don't think you are, <laughs> but, um, but thank you so much. <laughs> I'm not, but it's colder in Arizona than it is in California. So. Such a baby, such a baby, <laughs> colder, 33 degrees it was this morning. So hopefully people who are listening to this, by, by the time this releases, we won't have snow on the ground here in Massachusetts, but it allows me to get a lot of work done. And you are someone as a mom yourself. I mean, I have just been floored by the, by what you have been able to accomplish. Um, not just as, you know, a a mom, a wife, um, you are a student of the crafts that you have. You also are a successful lactation consultant so much that, um, people are just begging to know, you know, what is, your special sauce. Uh, What is it that you are putting together? And so you created the Practice Success Collective where you're helping holistic practitioners really step into their power and run a successful business. So um, 
Tell me a little bit more about that, Jacqueline. So I, I like the phrase that you use, the difference between being just a health practitioner, as a, a lot of my audience, you know, probably would, would check that box that they're, you know, health practitioners, and a healthpreneur. You know, what are those two types of practice owners? What, are that, what does that look like for you? That's a, that's a great question. And I get asked that a lot. And for me, me, the biggest thing is just shifting the mindset from being the person who, you know, when you're, when you're a holistic practitioner, you get into this work because you care, because you really want to help people. And so you're very immersed in it, right? You want to make sure you're doing everything right. You want to make sure that you're giving your patients the care they need. And you can get so wrapped up in that sometimes that you lose sight of, okay, actually I'm running a business right? And so you have to think like a business owner to make good decisions for your business. And one of the things that really kind of hits home with a lot of practitioners that I talk to is, you know, treat your business like you treat a patient. You know, is it thriving? Because I know you want your patients to thrive. Or are you just kind of getting by? You're just randomly booking appointments. Maybe you're not even committed to a price point and you kind of change it or you can be talked into a different price depending on a circumstance. Um, and so you, you're continually like making sacrifices or things, or you're feeling like you can't get all your work done because, you know, you haven't really organized things or outsourced things, or you just don't have time because you're busy seeing patients, but you don't have time to devote to the marketing and growing. And so when you start thinking like a healthpreneur, a practice owner and looking at it from that lens, then you can get really clear on the business tasks that need to get done to keep your business going and building it and getting more patients and getting good reviews and all those things, which are really important for your business to stay in business. Mm, you bring up a lot of important um, topics there. And um, the one around price, I mean, that for me kind of stood out that you said, um, getting your prices down. And I've worked with some practice owners myself. And when I've asked them, you know, what do you charge for that program? Um, it almost depends on the person. And I said, what do you mean it depends on the person? Um, out of all that laundry list, would you say pricing? Um, and where would you start? Would it be pricing? Pricing is a good one, yes. And I feel like that was something that I had struggled with in the beginning where I would, I would change it depending on how sorry for someone I felt, which is not a good business you know, transaction to make, right? Um, and I did that just based off of, that was an emotional decision. It wasn't a practical one. And I was making assumptions about my clients and patients' abilities to pay that maybe I shouldn't have been, um, you know. And so sometimes I hear this from practitioners a lot where they'll say someone is kind of adverse to the price. And because they don't practice these selling skills or skills of persuasion or whatever, the only way that they have to convince that person to book with them is to offer them a lower rate. So that's what they end up doing. And so then, yeah, their prices range all over the place. You know, they might discount at $20, $50, whatever, or instead of charging them for like supplements that they sell in their practice, they might just give them away um, and just include them in the visit. And there's just not like a lot of thought and planning with it. And so I hear that a lot. That's a really big struggle um, that they that they deal with on a daily basis. Mm. What what a different vibration too you bring um, to that experience with your patient or client. Um, feeling sorry. That's so interesting. I mean, I imagine going into something and I've done the same. I mean, from a consultant perspective, there are some practices and I'm like, oh, I feel sorry for them. And then if they're feeling sorry for their patients, I mean, uh, wow, that I hadn't thought about that. Um, and just the energy that that must bring to the patient visit. Um, and you're, I don't know how you would ever yeah. create consistent income. So I know you've, you know, not just been successful yourself that, you know, that most lactation consultants have to supplement their income, you know, whether it's working at a hospital, working for someone else, um, you know, not making this more of a hobby than an actual career. But um, you decided, you know, not just to take control, to be a healthpreneur, to run a successful practice. Um, but what, what made it change for you? that you decided to start working with other practitioners to help them grow? And, that, you know, what kind of people do you work best with? That's a really good question. So before I even got my board certification as a lactation consultant, I was actually running a chiropractic office. And it was just this weird 
like divine intervention thing where I was staying home with my son. I only had one kid at the time. And this chiropractor ended up being a really good friend of mine. And her um, office assistant just walked out on her one day. And she was like, I have patients to see and I can't return phone calls to book people. And she was just a mess. And I was like, well, I'll just come in and like book appointments for you and help you and stuff. So I did that for like three days and I didn't, she's a friend, you know, I didn't even expect her to pay me. And she was like, you are so awesome. Like, I, well, I'm totally going to pay you. And like, she offered me a job as her assistant. And I said, okay, but I have my son. So, you know, I, you want to pay me 16 bucks an hour, but like I have my son. And she was like, I treat kids. We have like a playroom in the waiting room. You can bring him with you. And I was like, sold, done. Wow. So I did that. And just, you know, I have a business background. I used to be a stockbroker. I used to work in real estate. So it's not like new to me to run a business. And so working in her practice, I saw like she didn't have the systems in place and she didn't even have the like financial accounting stuff in place or the marketing and all this stuff. So I just, she's my friend. I'm just excited about helping her. I get to bring my kid with me and get paid. This sounds awesome. So I just start implementing all the stuff and all of a sudden, like all these patients, are coming in. And when I would talk to them on the phone, I would really sell her. And this was something that she just wasn't capable of doing herself. She was so good at her craft, but mm -hmm. she was not good at running the business. And even to this day, we're still good friends. And she still tells everybody, like she's hired all these other people since. And she's like, Jacqueline was the one person who like kept my practice thriving. And I'm still struggling ever since. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, I mean, she's not, you know, she's doing okay. But it's mm -hmm. like, she really, me being there was like what it really, you know, jump started her. Um, so I did that. And then just, you know, once I became a, a lactation consultant and I, you know, was pretty successful pretty quickly. I had some big up and downs right in the beginning. Um, but quickly I was like, okay, what do I need to do? Apply those skills that I know about business into my own practice. And once I implemented those things, then things really took off. And I would just have lactation consultants asking me, hey, what's your secret? Can I pay for like an hour of your time? And I just started doing that on, you know, on a one-off basis. Um, even a lot of chiropractors locally would solicit help and bring me in for consulting. So I was already doing it. And then one day it just occurred to me after being asked over and over again, I don't actually have to do this one-on-one. -on -one. Everybody can learn from each other as a community and I can teach multiple people at once. And so that's why I created my program at that point. Mm, I love you and I are in two group coaching programs together. That's how we met. And I, I, the power of group coaching um, is really incredible. And I, I've changed my business model a lot as well because of that. Because um, I can only think of so many questions and an individual can only think of so many, but it changes everything when you make it a group coaching program and you can learn from so many other people. Um, and so uh, good for you for doing that. And you were just absolutely killing it with what you're doing. The feedback, I've been following you. Um, practices just love what you bring and you have a really great point. And, you know, the difference I think between you and I is that you're actually a practitioner. <laughs> you know, I can teach <laughs> the theory of what I know and the experience I have from my dad being a practitioner, but you firsthand understand what it's like to open up your book on a Monday and, you know, see the week with a lot of big empty spaces in it and to understand what it's like to pay everyone else first. And um, I, I think you just bring a lot of empathy to the clients that you have and the consultant, the consultant, consultant work that you do. Oh, that was a tongue twister. Um, <laughs> one of the other things that you and I are really have worked on together and I've just, uh, I've watched you it change completely is with mindset, integrity, and working from vision. And so I saw that you bring a lot of that with your clients. And, um, you know, these are really crucial components um, that you've built the foundation of your success on. But how do you then, um, you know, have that so it helps other practitioners? How do you help them hone their skills of, you know, their mindset and their vision? That's, that's an awesome question. Um, probably the bigger reason, other than just me being asked to help people with their practices uh, to, you know, create an environment for that to happen, was because I love helping people one-on-one -on -one and it lights me up and it's awesome to see them, you know, completely transform from a place of pain and sadness and heartache to everything's wonderful now. Um, but I, I kept feeling like, gosh, you know, that's a lot of like hard work and I'm really struggling to make the impact that I want. 
Like, how am I going to help more people than just, you know, if I can only see seven patients a day, like, well, I can do that five days a week, but like, I'm only making a small dent in the world and the help that people need and I can't do it all myself. So how do I help other people? You know, there's people trained out there, right? Like how, how do I help them get better at what they're doing? So when I started sitting down and crafted my, and, and this is kind of how I teach people to do it is what's the big picture? Like there's either, you know, a revenue goal that you have, or there's an impact goal that you have. And if you're holistic and if you're anything like me, it's probably more of an impact driven goal um, because you're passionate about what you do. So I was like, what if I could change, you know, the, what if I could change the breastfeeding rates in my state or the country or like, you know, what if I got more, most moms breastfeeding until a year, like they all tell me their goals are instead of, you know, two weeks or six months or whatever. Um, what if they didn't have to suffer as much anymore? What if I didn't have to hear from these moms all the time that they couldn't find someone in their area? And I'm going, I know someone who lives in your town who's been practicing for 20 years. So I don't want that to happen anymore. I don't want these sob stories to happen anymore. So I created my vision from, I would love to impact, you know, the lives and health of a million people this year. That's what I want to do. I'm not going to do that myself. Um, so how do I do that? So when I tell other people how to create your vision, pick that big number first. Maybe it's a revenue goal. Like you need to support your family and yourself and whatever. And you know, you can work out what that dollar amount is. Maybe it's an impact goal. There's something specific that you want to change in the world. And then you work backwards from that. So drill that down. What do you have to do on a quarterly, you know, yearly basis, quarterly basis, then go weekly, then go daily. And like what three things a day can you do to be moving forward from that and create actionable steps for yourself to get to that point? Because it's nice to say, well, in 2019, I'd like to make, you know, a hundred thousand dollars in my practice. Cool. That's awesome. And then when you get to the end of 2019, you either made it or you didn't, but how did you know what you needed to do every single day of the year to get there? Right. If you don't make, if you don't break it down and hundred thousand sounds like a lot, like some people might be like, I hope I can get there. Mm -hmm. Right. How am I going to get there? I don't know. That's overwhelming. Well, how much is that a quarter? Right. Just divide that in four. Okay. Well, that's a little more doable. And then divide that in three and oh, that's a little more doable. That's what I have to make this month to get to my goal. And if, if you go monthly, then you go weekly and so on and so forth. So then it's very easy. Then, you know, I need three appointments a day, every day of the week to get there. What am I going to do to get three appointments a day? Could you fit more than three a day? Sure you could. So then you know you can get past your goal. So there's all these things that people look at these goals and think they kind of almost get like discouraged before they start. Well, I'd love to double my revenue or quadruple it or I'd love to leave, you know, my job at this clinic, but how am I ever going to replace that income? Well, what's that number? What are you trying to replace? And then you can reverse engineer it. I appreciate you, you know, starting that with saying, you know, that you struggled with that yourself and wow, like that is a huge impact goal to say that this year you're going to help a million people impact a, a million people and you're right. And I, you know, just listening to, I'm sure you have the exact plan with how many people need to go through your program and, you know, what size practices they need to have and how you're going to track it, you know, but that takes a lot. Like you have to be driven. Uh, what do you do on the days when you don't feel so driven? I mean, are you, are your goals plastered around your office? Are you reading them? I mean, how are you staying? Um, how are you staying committed to that huge, big, passionate goal? That's, that's a good question. Um, I kind of just chose three values that I wanted to adopt to reach my goal. And one of those was commitment. Um, the other one was integrity and the other one was responsibility. So for, I have to be committed every single day and do something every day that gets me closer to my goal. But that might not necessarily be like a huge, big action taking thing, like being on your podcast right now, like your podcast has a big audience. And so I can, you know, impact people that way. Um, but there might be a day that self care is what it takes to be committed. If I'm not scheduling that stuff in, if I'm not taking that time to be aligned and be in the right state of mind and vibration, I'm not going to be doing great work. So, you know, I tell people like, it's not all rah, 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 go, go, go. Like, yes, that is part of it. But you also really have to, you know, re-examine, are these the things that are working? Like what's working for me? What's not? Stop thinking, take time off because that's when the ideas and creativity flow. 
Um, and then as for like responsibility, like I'm the only one that create can create the outcome I want. No one else is going to do that for me. And so everything I do, whether it works or it doesn't, I take responsibility. I don't blame others. So like if I, you know, go to meet with a doctor that I'd like to refer to me and he doesn't like what I have to say, you know, I, I don't sit there and go, oh, well, screw that guy. Like, mm -hmm. oh, he doesn't like me, whatever. I mean, I definitely don't feel like emotionally attached to it. I just move on and go to the next. But if I did that, if I consistently blamed other people for why I'm not getting referrals, well, I'm probably not going to keep going out and putting myself out there and asking for them. But if I said, well, maybe there's something there, the way I said something, I kind of noticed his body language shifted and, you know, there might be a different way to approach somebody like him. I'm not going to know until I go out and test that again. Mm. And so it's about like getting back up, trying again and just never giving up. And so I think for me, like taking responsibility for what happens in my business was really crucial um, where I don't let myself off the hook. You know, and it's not about whether or not I meet that goal at the end of the year. I mean, realistically, I'm not going to actually know if I impacted lives of a million people, but I'm taking actions to do that. So I'm not attached to that number. Let's say my revenue goal is whatever, you know, if I don't hit that number, that's okay. It's that the fact that I was doing the things that I needed to be doing to make that happen. Mm. Um, you definitely shift yourself into that CEO role. I mean, it, it's amazing that you're taking responsibility for, you know, the viability of your own practice and then the viability of, you know, the work that you do with other practitioners. But, you know, just to kind of wrap this up, let's get a little nitty gritty. You know, you're saying that there's 10%, there are 10% of the activities that a practitioner does is what generates revenue in a practice. So, I mean, for you, you know, you gave some great examples, but I know that you have some just, you know, universal things that generate revenue that practitioners need to focus on. You know, what are those activities? Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Um, you know, most people, if I ask them that question and I do that in my program, like, hey, what do you think those activities are that generate revenue? And they're like, seeing patients. And I'm like, actually, no, no. Running their credit card does, but not the actual appointment, right? And so they're, they kind of feel a little confused about that, and, and it's something that we talk about a lot, but this is a great, you know, kind of tip for people to start thinking, like, what actually generates revenue, brings more money in that wasn't going to be there before? And it's sales, it's marketing, and a lot of people who are practitioners don't like to think of themselves in that way or they say, I don't want to be salesy or I'm not good at sales. And they say all these things and it's like, well, if that were true, you'd have zero patients. So obviously you're doing something right. Um, but it's not like you don't have to be a car salesman to grow your practice. Um, but yeah, those, you have to be marketing. You have to schedule time for that in your day. It can't just be seeing patients, seeing patients, seeing patients. You've got to be doing some sort of outreach. So that looks different for everybody. It might be speaking at um, conferences or local events. It might be sponsoring something. It might be hosting free workshops um, or webinars or whatever. You know, you could have maybe an ebook or a book or something that you've put out there um, that's going to sort of drive people into you, right? And that's more that's more like of a tortoise strategy. But you know, what are you doing to actively get people into the practice and retain them? So that's also another thing that people miss sometimes is like, okay, I'm really good at getting new patients, but they don't seem to come back. Okay, well, what are you doing to, you know, I mean, that's, if they're healed and whatever, that's awesome. Like, great, you know, but they're probably going to have something else at some point in their life pop up. I bet you can probably help them with that. So how are you keeping that engagement going and things like that? And those are all tasks that as a business owner, especially a small one, maybe it's just a team of one right now. Maybe you're just a solo practitioner. You don't even have an assistant. You have to be doing those things, you know, and that's where people start to get overwhelmed because they'll be like, well, I'm doing the marketing, I'm doing the advertising, but I'm doing the billing and I'm doing the payment processing and I'm doing IT and, you know, it's too much. And it's like, well, okay, that's where you figure out, you kind of list it out. Like, what are the things that actually bring revenue in, like generate it? And what are the things that I have to do to keep my business running? You make a list of those two things and then that list of things to keep the practice running. What can you outsource? Is there an online system that you can buy, pay for a monthly subscription that's going to do that for you? Or can you hire someone? Because the less you do of those kinds of tasks, the more time you have to see patients and to grow the practice to get more patients coming in. Mm -hmm. 
there's definitely a stigma around the word sales and marketing. And I, I like, you know, what you offer and saying, you know, what could that look like? Like a community event or, um, you know, getting, uh, collaborating with another practitioner to get referrals to come in. I mean, you can change the word too. And you and I know that there's people that we've worked with that if a word just doesn't resonate with them, if it's not, um, doesn't feel aligned with what they're doing, sometimes even just changing the word you know, to community yeah. outreach as opposed to marketing or swiping the credit card, <laughs> collecting payments, <laughs> uh, you know, cashing the check. <laughs> How many times, you know, is it, is it just like, where is it getting bottlenecked and call it that instead? I, I like that idea um, a lot. So, um, you know, that's, that's great because it is, it's not just the seeing of the patients. I, I can, attest to that. I know a lot of practitioners that see patients and with the way reimbursements are going, it doesn't mean that they're making it in their practice. <laughs> it's, you know, certain visits they need to see with certain insurances and they need to make sure it gets paid. And <laughs> that's the other thing. So um, you're right. I mean, sitting down and kind of brain dumping, like what makes you money and what generates more activity. That's a, that's a really great idea. But and we're coming up on our time. And so um, a question that I like to ask everyone is if we were to, you know, a, Fast forward in time, five to 10 years, and you could look back and you could say, you know, I did it. What would that look for you, Jacqueline Kinzer? Mm. Well, you know, my heart is definitely with the other lactation consultants of the world because that's primarily what I do um, amongst other modalities. But what I would love to see looking back is them owning thriving practices, multiple locations, like just being everywhere and being known because there are literally probably three or four dedicated Facebook groups to like th their profession is hurting. Like there's actually one called like, is it a relevant profession? Like, yes, it's so relevant. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we've got to stop feeling sorry for ourselves. And, and I'm, it's not limited to lactation consultants. I know acupuncturists feel this way and functional medicine doctors, and all these other people, right? So how do we really get ourselves on the world stage? That's what I want to look back and see is that people who practice holistic medicine aren't just seen as alternative or optional or like, oh, if I could, if I had more money, I would definitely pay for that. I want us to really be seen as like an essential, you know, like the first go-to. Like if you break your leg, awesome. Go to the hospital or urgent care or whatever. But like, you know, if you've got a cold or you're, you've got digestion issues or breastfeeding issues or whatever it is, I want that first thought to be, I'm going to go see, you know, this holistic practitioner. Mm -hmm. That's the impact that I would love to make because that's like how I personally live my life is like, you know, an MD is like so not on my radar for anything, but that's a big paradigm shift. And I know it's possible, but I can't, you know, we can't depend on patients to make that paradigm shift on our own. We've got to do it as practitioners. Right, right. Yeah, no, it is crazy. Like our ERs are so full. We don't need to go. I mean, I, and I only think MD because I call my dad first. <laughs> so if it wasn't <laughs> my dad, but I mean, otherwise you're right. I mean, it's the access is really hard. Uh, and I think that we really will have a more positive impact if you know, we take this community health approach and, you know, I love my holistic practitioners because they're so much more approachable and they spend so much more time. And, you know, I can't believe that there are some professions that feel like they're marginalized, but um, I, Jacqueline, I just love what you're doing because I think it does it. It comes down to mindset. It comes down to integrity and growing your practice. And sometimes, you know, just plugging into a community. So um, I know you don't often take on new students and you're very structured, but um, where can our listeners get on the wait list for the next time that you open up your group coaching? Yeah, um, that's just right on my website, JacquelineKinsler.com. So um, when the program's not open, I have a wait list and I have the blog there so they can get lots of great information and they can connect with me there. Thanks so much, Jacqueline. I will send everyone there that'll all be in the show notes. So um, I appreciate you and I can't wait to see you again in person sometime soon. Me too. And thanks for having me on your podcast. Thanks, Jacqueline.
Thanks so much for listening. I want to hang out with you more. I truly believe your success is related to the people you spend the most time with. That's why I created the free community, the Girlfriends Group of Health Practitioners. It's a safe space for you to connect with other soul practitioners who don't just want to keep the doors of their practice open, but they want to impact the health of their community. Head over to www.saratugender.com and hit the tab at the top that says group. Go in there and introduce yourself today. I'll see you soon.